Uh, my name is uh, Keith Woodcock, and uh, my profession is a city and regional planner. Hi, so I'm Corey Hahn, uh, planning manager at the city of Pismo Beach. My name is Chris Clark. I am on the faculty at Cal Poly in the city and regional planning department. <laughs> CEQA stands for the California Environmental Quality Act. Examines projects uh, to see what their environmental impacts or effects will be and tell the public and decision makers what those effects will be and how they might be uh, reduced. Typically, it will go through an initial study process um, and through that determine whether or not the project can be exempt. If not exempt, whether it can go through um, a negative declaration, or would it have to go through a full-blown EIR? And as a practicing planner, or... I must say it's going on 11 years. Just almost exactly 30 years. Quite a number of years that, that it is part and parcel to, to uh, my work. Uh, first one is, uh, oh my goodness, we're doing a, an EIR, Environmental Impact Report. Look at the costs and look at the time delays. Uh, I hear that from uh, other planners and particularly developers. They do not like the word or hear the phrase EIR. Is people believe that it is a set of regulations that tell um, how projects have to be carried out, what changes have to be made and things like that. If there is an impact, people assume that there must be a mitigation measure. Well, it is a lengthy process. CEQA is a biased, I guess you might say, towards doing uh, an environmental impact report. There are other levels of, of environmental review, uh, but if, say, that you can't exempt it, uh, you can't do a negative declaration on it, that you have significant effects, you're into an EIR. And, and most developers uh, are savvy to that. They understand the process, but some are not, or they protest it. I guess the, uh, the length of time it takes the agency to get a consultant on board and things like that. The truth is, is that CEQA is an informational set of regulations. It's designed to pull um, from science and history what the impacts of a particular project might be and then suggest remedies for that. But it does, we say in the industry that CEQA doesn't have teeth. It doesn't say thou shalt do this or thou shalt not do this. It just offers ideas and solutions to problems. We gotta remember that CEQA is still a piece of legislature, right? There's, there's gonna be rules, there's gonna be different boundaries, um, different things to consider. It's, it's not always aligned with what we think of from a practical standpoint. So it changes um, every year. I mean, if we look at, you know, if you were to attend a conference, you know, usually held by AEP or any other um, organization, you'll see that there's always something new coming up. Um, different interpretations, like it may not always be a change, a significant change in the legislature, in the law itself. There are different case laws that come out based on different scenarios. And sometimes we, der we derive different interpretations and different practices from that case law. Now that the challenges are, how do we respond to like uh, global warming, uh, energy use, uh, water conservation? So, so as the environmental issues have become more complex, CEQA has become more complex. And a lot more effort has been put into the CEQA analyses that are done. Some of the people I worked for who'd been in CEQA since it started uh, talk about how they would write 20-page environmental impact reports, and I've written 1,000-page environmental impact reports. So it's gotten more complicated, it's gotten far more expensive, and it's gotten far more contentious. Mistakes are made every day. I, I sure I've made hundreds of mistakes, but the mistakes are rarely um, binary, where you did it right or wrong. They're more a matter of degree. Did we put enough effort into this discussion? There is no end to the amount of information that you can put into a, uh, an analytical document. It's important to keep track of the timelines. When you give notice, when you file something, 
um, what type of information is provided in those notices. It sounds like such a no-brainer. And that's where the gotchas are. When you have the CEQA document, it goes out for its uh, public uh, re review comment period. Some people go over it with a fine-tooth comb. So if you don't follow the process, uh, if, if you haven't done your proper noticing, uh, if, if you uh, mischaracterize the project uh, or, or uh, underanalyze uh, the impacts and just say, hey, it's not important or whatever, uh, those are important gotchas. Well, I've had several and I expected that. When you write a document, that, or a secret document, be it whatever level, you know, the, the exemption or the neg deck or the EIR, I uh, always expect that, that it can wind up uh, being challenged. We didn't see any litigation. I worked on dozens of environmental projects without litigation. Uh, it was the, the sewer project that I mentioned and then some of the high profile projects at Cal Poly. Fortunately not. Um, I have not gone through any project that, that you know, ended up in litigation. It depends. It depends. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's good and bad to everything, right? And there's, and CEQA's not immune to that. There's pros and cons to it. Good, like so many things, you know, um, college education, great. Too expensive? Yes. Redundant? Yes, in many ways. Um, could it be refined and improved and made more effective? Yes, 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 yes. Would I throw the whole thing out? No. But, the, but just, it's, the binary question is always the trickiest one. Would we throw it out? No, I don't want to go back to a world where people don't think about environmental consequences of the projects that they do. I want to live in a world where people have thought it through and improved things. And that's what we do with CEQA. But we can really discipline it so that it's not abused and weaponized. CEQA changed from an opportunity for decision makers to think about the environmental consequences, that was the true purpose. And for the public to be involved in those decisions, um, all the way to it becoming a big scale, competitive political um, mess. And it's cost California a huge amount of housing, a huge amount of important projects, and it needs to be reined in. No, I think that was, uh... That, that, that was the uh, sort of the watershed moment uh, for CEQA because the, the, I feel I really feel for the courts uh, on this because here comes a private project, a, a condominium uh, project uh, in, in Mammoth Lakes, and, and there was no definition of what is a project. There was not clarity as does CEQA apply to private projects. And what is mitigation? These things were not defined in the original state law. And so you can imagine the, the court say, well, gee, this is a fine kettle of fish that we've been given, and we've got to solve these issues. Well, the legislature, to their credit, just said, oh, we really need to change all this. And so uh, they, they changed and defined what a project is what the process is, that yes, it does apply to private uh, private projects. And they set up uh, the uh, governor's office of uh, OPR, uh, and, and that was now the clearinghouse on that. So the, I call it the mother case, the, the Friends of Mammoth, uh, was, was uh, crucial in helping define, uh, helping define CEQA. I think that Mammoth was the right thing to do. I think that the law probably would have headed in that direction anyways. But I think the court correctly anticipated that uh, if the government was going to be involved, even in the permitting of projects, it should it should uh, go forward. The the philosophical issue that I have with CEQA in that regard, uh, and this is where I contrast it with Ma the state of Massachusetts, where I'd worked before. Massachusetts has a similar law, but they only really review really large projects, um, and. In California, CEQA got very narrow, very intense, and a huge amount of money and effort was spent on projects that are fairly routine. I would like to see, you know, the categorical exemptions cover more of what we want to see in our world. Work with planners, land use planners and communities to determine 
categorically what we do want to exempt so that projects that that we want to see as you know as a community uh, we can get them through the process like if it's something that we want we want in our in our community whether it's housing or you know different services um, if we can find a way to exempt them without having any side effects you know, adverse side effects um, I think that would be very helpful um, and you know I think that that that's something that could be considered and it's something that doesn't have to be set in stone you know it can evolve over time it can be something that hey it might make sense today it may make sense you know in the next five years next 10 years but maybe it doesn't make sense in the next 20, 15 to 20 years so you know being proactive in, in what we exempt and what we don't one problem that has nagged sequa i wouldn't say from the beginning but but uh, it started picking up in the 1980s is other groups, interest groups, uh, hijacking the CEQA process to get their, to get their um, uh, agenda. It's, it's used by other corporations. If a shopping center is being proposed, likely the, the uh, litigator is at some other um, shopping center company or whatever, some competition. And so they use it not for environmental purposes, they use it for competitive purposes, or it'll be used for political purposes. I'd like to see the bar increased for litigation. I would like to see judges um, who are steeped in in CEQA. Uh, the first lawsuit we were involved in, the judge had never had a CEQA case before, so he had a pretty big learning curve and he acknowledged that until you have a specialized group and they do train judges for this um, who can handle these cases and quickly say to lawyers we're not dealing with that or that's trivial or um, you're wasting our time with unnecessary information and you're you're costing too much uh, uh, money the other thing is that this is this is a controversial thing, but uh, CEQA is a relatively easy thing to challenge in court. And again, um, you want to give neighbors and folks that we call NIMBYs, not my backyard, whatever, you want them to have the opportunity to bring um, uh, a challenge to CEQA and have the opportunity to be heard about a thing. I would like to hear, I would like to hear what you think would be a, the, the, what would you like to see change in, in CEQA? So I'm not here to sell you any side of this argument. Um, these episodes were made for the intent to inform you in an unbiased way. Um, but here's my personal take on kind of the whole landscape currently as a graduating planning student. Um, CEQA itself is a public disclosure law. Uh, what that means is that it's meant to kind of inform the public and CEQA is a very effective disclosure law in that regard. Uh, whether it's good or bad really depends on how it's being used um, in the context of things. Without it, it's true that developments wouldn't attempt to mitigate any environmental effects they might have on the environment. However, at the same time, it can be hijacked by special interest groups. The law itself is at times complicated. Um, it's so complicated that you kind of need to be a pseudo lawyer to kind of understand the statutes and what they're trying to say. Um, and while planners do have guidelines um, that we follow, these themselves are sometimes vague um, and purposely vague as well. Um, and so that kind of makes it more difficult for us to follow the guidance from the guidelines, if that makes sense. Um, because of how the law is mostly um, written uh, for more lean or like mid-sized and smaller planning authorities. Um, we usually, those, those authorities usually don't have that much capacity in dealing with CEQA, so they have to like contract that out. Or um, everyone works at CEQA a bit and you have your staff very well-rounded to an extent. But um, these smaller and like, medium-sized planning agencies will have 
kind of a harder time and a longer time getting to kind of process whatever large SQL project or SQL project lands on their counter. Um, and currently, uh, because of how SQL is written as well, I think that it's important as a planner that SQL should be clear in its guidance um, and statutes about what is required and what is allowed and not. Um, there's currently a lot of bloat in SQL, uh, in SQL documents specifically, uh, because of the lack of clear guidance and how the statutes are written. Um, and this is because uh, we're kind of scared of litigation. We don't want the project getting litigated. If you get some a document challenged you, and you know you, you get a challenge and you know it gets uh, agreed by with the court, you kind of lost that. That that's kind of like a failure on your part um, to an extent. Um, I think that there should be higher bars uh, to litigation because that would also make the process harder to hijack for special interests, but as well as to bring down that fear as well and in addition bring down that um, cloaked, bloat. Overall, SQL is a good law. It has good roots and it has good bones. And its main purpose is still the same as it was 50 years ago. It's just that times have changed and how the way SQL has changed has not been the most optimal. Um, more straightforward language and higher bar of litigations is what I believe is needed to make a SQL more of an effective law again um, and more in line with what the original intent was. Um, I want to give my thanks to the many people who helped me make this series, including the people you saw on screen today. Um, I'll be back with content after I move down back to SoCal, uh, after I start my job as an environmental planner at a firm that shall not be named. Um, until then, have a good night.